when you start to think very clearly about um, what it is that you do and why you do what you do, a lot of it comes not from this whole notion of photography, but whatever it is that fulfills you as a person. Hey, Wiki Hunters, welcome to another podcast or the Art of Photography podcast. Almost forgot my own podcast name there. My apologies. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really exciting. It's been an amazing journey. Um, it's, it's been really inspiring, just not for um, not only for you guys, but also for me talking to these amazing photographers and sharing their, their wisdom um, and their knowledge. It's just really amazing. Um, I actually have not only watch them once or twice I've watched multiple times and going back over again so really really awesome to hear these guys just share their knowledge and yeah today we have um, one of my early mentor when I first started photography actually I learned one of the um, flash one of the technique flash yeah one of the technique from him and he's uh, it's that was like it's crazy um we'll talk a little bit more about it but this is Seng, and he is um w one of the um he runs um photography trips all around the world and he is um one of the um the go-to person i suppose i think for um people in perth um so Seng, how you doing welcome to the yeah, podcast yeah thanks stanley good to be here yeah, I can't. I can't believe how long it did. Uh, it's been, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a long time ago. I've been running the business uh, for what is it, eleven years now? But yeah, I think you came. You came in a few years ago, right? Yeah, I remember it being a few. Yeah, years ago. so I, fresh, I actually. Came, sorry, yeah, yeah. So I came in. I think three times. Um, two of the walkthrough, and I remember I, I booked two of the the photo walkabout with you with you, and then I for I I I um. I had the, the, the reservation wrong, or I thought I had the wrong reservation and I went to the wrong location. It was so funny. Um, I it's like, oh yeah, that was in Fremantle. You went to the wrong location in Fremantle. <laughs> yeah, I went to the one next week or something. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's oh. right. <laughs> it was, it was so oh, funny. those were the days. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, like, um, so like, I've, I've learned a lot from you and, um, you know, watching your, not only from your workshop, but also watching your photography and um, um, the way you compose and the way you vision a lot of the scenery. Um, so just tell us a little bit about yourself so um, the listeners know about you and maybe a little bit of um, origin story of, you know, how this photography um, passion come about. Okay, I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Otherwise, it just gets uh, gets a little bit too long. So, my name is Sengma, and I'm uh, based in uh, Perth, in Western Australia. Uh, I've been living here for about thirty seven years now. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, I was actually born in Malaysia, uh, but came here as a young person with my family and things like that. I I run a, a business called Venture Photography Workshops and Tours, and it's got two branches of it. Workshops is the education part of it. So, as Sammy mentioned earlier. I, uh, I teach photography a whole gamut of different things from beginners all the way down to advanced lighting and portraiture landscapes and so on. But then I also run photography tours, which was great up until around, I suppose, March 2020 when, uh, when the world and the pandemic kind of shut things down. And so at the moment, I'm just uh, running tours in Western Australia, um, and, uh, which is the state um, I'm in, in Australia. And, uh, and I run my photography classes um, with some regularity, it's my. I'm a full-time professional photographer. I also do. Uh, I also do commercial photography um, on the side as well. Um, so yeah, I still work as a photographer, but I teach photography and I take people away on photography trips. You asked me about my passion. I think. Um, I think a lot of us get into photography just because we um, like creating things. And uh, and one of the things which I, I that got me into photography was really kind of just um, in a way kind of documenting moments. And I guess you know at the moment now uh, my, my preferred genre in photography is. Um, travel and documentary and I think it comes from the fact that I, I do enjoy documenting moments and then just from basically using my dad's old Nikon film camera I kind of graduated around 2004 2005 and got my first um, digital SLR and things basically progressed from there so I've been running venture photography workshops and tours for about 11 years now yeah 
Wow, 11 years. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. It's a long, long time. <laughs> but it feels, like, it feels like only last year that I started. So it's uh, obviously enjoying it. Uh, <clears throat> did you actually study photography or? No, I'm, I'm self-taught. I'm what you call a self-taught person. It's an interesting thing in photography. I find that um, it's probably one of those fields that you can get into without actually having to complete any kind of formal qualification. And from my understanding, uh, in terms of the sorts of formal training that you do, it, it takes two sides of it. One's the practical industrial side. So basically, you learn how to take photographs. You learn how to uh, work as a professional photographer so that you can do commercial work or portraiture work and, uh, or weddings or things like that. Uh, you learn a bit about the marketing side of things. Uh, and then the other side of it is probably more the, the history and theoretical side of things, the looking at, at photography within the, uh, uh, the framework of, um, I suppose, the history of photography and the work of other photographic practitioners and people who are working in a whole range of different styles and genres and things like that, and relating photography back to the whole notion of, um, of art and the way of seeing and stuff like that. And I think... Um, you know, quite often uh, to be a good photographer, you really need this great combination of um, both of them, um, one thing and the other, uh, in order to be able to produce the great images, but also to be able to understand where the, the, the images that you're producing, where they sit in relation to what has been produced before, what has been created at the moment, and uh, what possible paths may be taken in terms of photographic image making into the into the future as well. So I think there's a it's quite often a nice balance there. And in some respects, because I'm completely self-taught, and I actually come, fortunately, I come from a, a fine art background as well. So I studied fine arts um, at university years and years and years ago. So uh, while I know the practical side of photography and the pragmatic side, you know how to how to teach photography, how to you know shoot, how to use lighting and all that, I also understand photography as a, as a form of artistic expression and where it sits um, at the moment in relation to all the work that's come before and, and potentially where it may lead down the, uh, down the line as well. That's, uh, yeah, that's amazing. I think, um, you know, um, there's a lot of, um, a lot of um, not only like, I guess, false perception that photography is um, it's not considered art. And I'm really, really glad that you mentioned that, you know, um, that there is uh, two things to photography. Um, one, of the, one of them is the, the artistic side of things. And the other one is like more the technical side with the camera and so forth. Um, so what, why would you like sort of like um, consider photography as an art? Because, uh, you know, nowadays everyone can kind of take photos, right? I mean the new iPhone takes such an amazing photos and um, would you consider like those photos as an art as well? Or, you know, what do you think? Share us your thought. Well, let me just answer that with another example because you gave an example of the iPhone and people being able to take images and all that. So let's say, for example, I have a wall in my home. Okay. I, I have a few choices. I'm going to paint it, but I've got a few choices, right? I could, um, uh, buy a, a big tub of paint and just paint a wall. Let's say I paint it cream, neutral vanilla color. color. Paint the wall cream and I've created a painting, correct? Yeah? Or I could, you know, take a mix of colors and I could splash the color around on the wall and I could just create a multicolored rainbow splattered wall. So I've also created a painting. Uh -huh. Or I could buy more colors and more paint and I could paint a landscape scenery on the wall and I've actually created a painting or I could instead buy a very large canvas and paint something else on the canvas and I've created a painting as well. So which one would you consider art and which one would you not consider art? So yeah, that's, that, that's my amazing. answer to your question. I, I have, I have uh, never heard that um, analogy before. That's, that's amazing. I think uh, um, for, yeah, for, for those people who kind of um, don't see it as an art, that's, that is amazing. Um, I'm I'm definitely gonna I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna take that and go like copyright it by, by so, thing. So, yeah, so I guess just a kind of uh, kind of prevaricate on what you're saying a little bit as well. I guess the, the thing with photography is um, photography emerged, I guess, historically almost in direct competition to what was perceived as art. Uh, back at that time, because suddenly there was the ability to create a way of capturing or, or documenting or representing a scene 
which you know compared to now took ages but back then was a lot faster and perhaps more realistic in its depiction than um, than painting so it created this massive kerfuffle in terms of what would you consider then you know what, what is photography where does it sit is it is it a tool is it um is it something that's used to to record uh, an aspect or representation of reality or or is it an art form is it just another way of expressing um the the, the inner vision or the artist's vision in that sense then it created a massive kind of paradigm shift um in the in the art world and I guess because photography and the use of the camera, uh, which is basically a light box that captures light, um, is different from, um, say, for example, being a sculptor or a, or, a, or a painter or something along the lines of an artist in that sense. Because photography is in the service of a whole range of different potential outcomes. So, say, for example, you could photograph something to record it, like, you know, real estate photographers photograph homes inside and out to provide a an advertisement for it you could create that so it, it serves a, a very pragmatic functional um, outcome in that in that respect there you could use it to take portraits of people essentially document what people look like and and that's another kind of really kind of very pragmatic functional um, purpose um, to photography you could use it to um, record events you could use it when you're traveling to record your travel experiences and things like that. So it still has a very um, um, practical reason for, for photography. And I think because a lot of people experience photography through this practical um, aspect of it, you know, think about it, right? Your, your earliest memories of, uh, of photographs, you know, it's quite often family photographs, photographs yourself of yourself as a baby taken by parents or grandparents and so on and so forth, you might see photographs, you know, from say, you know, your parents' generation, your grandparents' generation, from their travels, from their trips, from their, you know, family gatherings at home and all that. So your introduction, as most people's introductions to photography would be some level of, of representation of, of their lives in that sense that even if it were someone born, you know, within the last 15 years or 10 years, their introduction to photography would be images they've seen on the phone or the, uh, the tablet and it's basically still a record in there so because of that i think we tend to perceive photography less as a an art form and more as something that is like a documentary a documenting recording kind of process but at the end of the day you know um the camera is still a box that captures light it's a technology in that box that has changed um, you know, over over time, I've changed a lot more rapidly recently, obviously, and um, so the way in which that particular box, that particular tool, is used, um, and the reason in which it's used, defines the actual product, whether it is a documentary thing or whether it's actually something um, quite artistic. You know, we always boil down to tools. You know, the, the analogy of the paint on the walls and the paint on the canvas, for example. Or if you've got um, rock and a sculptor with a hammer and different types of chisels, those are the tools. At the end of the day, it's just a set of tools. And, and what it actually creates can then be regarded as to whether it's something that's pragmatic. So, you know, they might, the, 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 the sculptor might produce a column or a pillar to hold up a wall. Or it might, they might produce a sculpture of such and such for whatever artistic purpose in there. I think. You know, when people say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, I think what is art is in the eye of the creator. And, uh, and, and quite often art is defined by a marketplace as well. So, you know, there, there, are, there are commercial entities out there um, who um, work very hard for their own purposes, commercial purposes to define what is art and what isn't. And I think there's always an agenda behind this definition of art. And unfortunately, a lot of um, people who work in the creative field agonize over whether what they're producing is art or not. And I think they spend far too much time agonizing about it rather than um, thinking about what it is that they're producing and then working hard to do something with what it is that they're producing, whether they're producing a, a column to hold up a wall or whether they're producing a beautiful sculpture. They, they, they need to define what it is that they are, what they're doing. So, so I guess in answer to that question in a very long convoluted way is why don't we just start by defining what art means to us and what we produce and then go from there. That's awesome. That is, uh, wow. It's just so much wisdom. Um, that's, uh, 
I'd, I'd never um, hear it in that perspective. And that's amazing to hear that in that perspective and the way you put it. Um, I love how you say, you know, um, a camera, even though with all the technology nowadays, at the end of the day, it's just a box. And um, you're right, you know, at the end of the day, the camera won't click by itself. You know, you have to set it up. It's, it's all in your hand as a, yeah. as a creative, um, uh, you know, the, the creative creator. So that's... Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I totally love that um, that you you mentioned that. Um, so you talk about document photography there, and um, you know, like um, how um, the the document um, document uh, trade photography might not be considered as much as um, um, art compared to like a lot of those like you know the fine art or the illustrative because you know the illustrative are um, a lot more closer because you don't actually take that realistic um, kind of image, at, but, you know, it gives you the creativity in there. Um, I personally think there are there is a lot of art in documentary, and I think you do too, and I would love for you to, to talk about that. Um, what what your thoughts on that in terms of um, documentary photography, especially when you travel and stuff like that, um, you know, and how it relates to the art side of things. I think at the end of the day, if you're going to look at documentary photography and travel photography, they all serve a particular purpose. And I think you need to define what it means to you. For me, everything starts with a definition for yourself. So, you know, you can, you can travel and create fine art pieces when you're traveling. As you know, you could, you know, you could travel to Canada and then create a beautiful wintry landscape that uh, you perceive as being a, an artistic expression of your, I don't know, sense of isolation or loneliness or something like, or, or, or peace or calm or, and then it might look really pretty and people might buy it for their own homes or it might resonate with someone else and they are drawn to it for purely emotional reasons. So in that way, um, you can create what is essentially thought of as artistic photography um, when you're traveling. You can also create illustrative work while you're traveling because you take a picture of a, a tree, you take a picture of a chapel, you take a picture of a hill and you Photoshop it all together. You can create those things. So um, you're creating something out of that through the process of travel. So at the end of the day, you still need to be able to define for yourself what you mean by documentary photography and what you mean by by travel photography. And for me, when I define it, it's it's very it's it, it coexists together because when I travel, I'm documenting something in terms of the travel. And the travel photography part of it simply means that when I travel, I'm looking at being able to photograph a sense of place and a sense of culture, a sense of community, and a sense of people um, in the uh, in the environment which I'm actually traveling in. Um, so that is that is my own definition of uh, of of travel and documentary photography. It's about it's about you know conveying uh, a moment, uh, an emotion, um, a story that's based on um, human activity, for example, uh, or a place uh, through um, through my photography there. And if someone else resonates with it and wants to um, call it art, that's great. Um, I. Sometimes we'll call it art, but you know, at the end of the day, I think I, uh, I, I mean, we call ourselves photographers, um, you know, in that sense there. And then when we're interrogated a little bit further, we might then start to go into genres of photography, like, you know, uh, I'm a travel photographer or I'm a documentary photographer and stuff like that. And then anything beyond that, I think is a lot of soul searching that comes to do it. But it's an interesting point that you, you talk about this art versus photography dichotomy, because as you know, within the photographic circles in the community, um, there appears to be a little bit of a backlash against things which are photographic in origin, but a lot of people don't consider photographs. So the illustrative work, for example, where people construct images from photographic sources, you know, a tree that was taken in there, a church that was taken in there, a cloud taken somewhere else, you know, a flock of birds taken somewhere else, and then they composite it together. So there are a lot of people who get up in arms and say, that's not photography, you know, that is art, <laughs> and, or that is, uh, that is um, illust that's an illustration. In fact, we have the category called illustrative photography in right. of itself. It's almost as if we need to categorize this thing. So that's the complete opposite of it, isn't it? Saying like, well, it's art now, we can't call it photography, you know? So I think those things are constantly being defined and redefined. And I just get back to the fact that at the end of the day, you have to be really true to yourself and you have to define it for yourself first. Because once you define something for yourself, it makes explaining your work a lot easier. So what I often tell people to do 
even if they're new to photography and they don't know what they like photographing and all that is if you can take a blank page and just let whatever's in your head stream out in terms of what it is. So you say, you know, I like to, and you just write, 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 write. That's the first step in being able to define what it is that, um, what it is that you, you like photographing and, and how you're going to go about defining what photography means for you to begin with. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Um, I think one thing that I really like um, from that point that you bring is that defining something for yourself. And, um, you know, in this media era and the social media era, I think a lot of times, and, you know, I'm, I'm one of those person where I, um, when I started, I, I was defined by everyone else instead of defining for yourself. Right. And, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then like after a while, like, you know, you, you, you get, you lose kind of the passion because you stop taking photo for yourself and, you know, you stop taking photo that express yourself. And I think like, especially in the photography era, one of the things that I love about photography is just the way that everyone perspective is different. And, you know, like it's, it's just, it's like you don't have to be the same that's what makes it great like the difference is what makes it great so i'm really glad that you mentioned that um yeah so i mean you you do a lot of different genre of photography isn't it you you go from mm -hmm. um, portrait to um commercial to travel to documentary um if you were like you know what's your favorite and or you know like what what do you like out of those things you know there's not a lot of people that actually like to do all um all the different genre because most mm. people are either like a landscape or a portrait or a wildlife and so forth and um how, how did you kind of like um get into um get that exposure to all these different genre it's really interesting because i never actually come from a position where i let what i do as a photographer be defined by other people uh, People like categories, people like labels. So they quite often ask questions like, what kind of photography do you do? Are you a landscape photographer? Or are you a portrait photographer? Or are you a animal photographer? Do you like wildlife and all that? And those are categories, right? Those are labels. And I think a lot of people who start off in photography, they, they think that they have to fix, they have to, they have to be able to um, fit into one of these little pigeonholes, these little boxes, in order to be able to then start to define what it is that they do. And this is where the kind of self-reflection comes in really handy because I think um, when you start to think very clearly about um, what it is that you do and why you do what you do, a lot of it comes not from this whole notion of photography, but whatever it is that fulfills you as a person, right? So I'm a person who enjoys learning about other people. I'm a person who enjoys um, connecting, with other people, engaging with other people. I'm actually, you know, um, they're very curious about other people's lives. Like before I took up photography um, in, a, in a very serious way, I also wrote a lot, like wrote stories and stuff like that. So uh, that's a, that's a, I was a storyteller. I enjoyed storytelling because of curiosity about creating things about people's lives. And I often talk to people and try to find out more about their lives and all that. So if you look at that aspect of it, that translates into an interest in people. And through photography, how do you basically represent an interest in people? You take pictures of people. You take portraits of people. So that's where the portraiture comes in. And then again, you know, with landscapes and all that, you know, there's a part of me which enjoys the natural world immensely and you enjoy going out and you enjoy seeing beautiful scenery and you look at beautiful light. And how do you go about expressing that creatively when you're a photographer? Oh, well, you become a landscape photographer and that basically then um, leads you on to try a whole range of different techniques. You know, you, you learn to photograph in the right light. You learn to chase that light. You learn to work with the light that nature has given you at a particular point in time, regardless of whether it was the light you're looking for or not. You learn other techniques, you know, that comes through like your long exposures, for example, using filters and uh, your focus stacking. And uh, in your case, your astrophotography, you know, um, that comes through um, in that aspect of it as well. So that's also sort of different in, 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 your, in your wilderness photography, for example, you know, the pristine landscapes that you find in the Rockies and things like that. So there is that aspect of it that, that appeals to me. And it still comes from the heart, it comes from a part of your spirit that says, I relate to the beauty in the natural world, all right? Um, you know, so there's that aspect of it. And how do you go about finding more and more about the world? Well, you know, you travel, for example. I, I have a 
an interest in um, culture and history. So a lot of my travel, and because I've got a background in art as well as literature for some strange reason, um, one of the things I love doing was basically to go to museums and stuff like that when I'm traveling. And I love going to those old historical towns because I've read about it. I've seen, I know the history of, of those areas. So it's about relieving that, that, that thing that when you go and travel there, you know? So how do you express that love of, of new, new worlds and new lands and new towns and all that kind of stuff? How do you express that love of being able to see for your very eyes ancient history uh, manifest in front of you? Well, you do that through your travel photography, your travel photography. So I think for me, and it's probably true for a lot of people, um, those labels don't mean anything because for me, it's really about, this is my interest. So I photograph what I'm interested in. Um, this is what resonates with me. So I photograph what resonates with me. It just happens to apply people can apply labels to them so that's why people say oh you know you photograph um portraits and you photograph landscapes and you photograph um the travel and all that you know so so people apply those categories and i think you know at the end of the day all you're doing is say you're a photographer and you're making images of things that you like and and experiences that resonate with you that's that's all it is so so that's, that's, for example, is a, a reason why you know, I'm not that interested in, say, photographing flowers that uh, doesn't appeal to me. Uh, I'm really not that interested in photographing birds because it, it doesn't appeal to me, you know, those sorts of things. So uh, I don't go around chasing little spiders and insects and all that with a macro lens because I'm not interested in it. So for me, um, photography is really about fulfilling what interests me and Acknowledging also that interests change over time. I may find new things that are very interesting to me, and then I may then pursue them um, photographically. And if there's a label that goes in it, great. If there isn't, well, that's fine as well. That's that's great. Yeah, um, you know, um, I I totally can resonate with that because I'm I'm a bit like that. I I just like to take photo of whatever. And um, mm. the reason why I like to take photo of the stars is just I love I. I, I grow to, I get frustrated being some, um, just always struggling with um, a lot of people, especially when here in the Rockies, you know, with the amount of tourists here. And when you do astro, um, but it, it's like photography, um, what photography was meant to me when I started was, it was more like a meditation. It was like me and the camera and the nature or with whatever it is I shoot, you know, whether it's a portrait or wildlife. So that, that's, that's why I, I, kind of get into more of the astro because of that reason but it's it's not necessarily that i you know i like to shoot astro more than the sunset i love sunset photos you know they're amazing but just that when i do sunset and sunrise usually there's like 20 other people next to me and you know sometimes you just want to be by myself and for that reason i i tend to do shoot more astro so, so that's pretty much an expression of your own personal um interests isn't it? your own the way you are as a person right yeah yeah, that's great. But so, um, what do you think of the social media? How how does that impact the perception of photography and how it kind of shape the the photography nowadays? Especially for those of you who who just started, right? Because this is all they know if they just started. Um, you know, for someone like you, you have that different um, understanding of what art is. Um, but for those people that kind of just started, they might not see anything past Instagram photography, you know? What do you think about, um, yeah, about that? But the first thing I've got to say is, I think what, what social media has done for photography and photographers is it's actually made a lot of people very aware about the value of the visual image, as opposed to basically just, say, um, someone writing a long essay and posting it on a blog or something along the lines of that. So Instagram, for example, uh, is clearly a very visually driven um, social media platform. And so what it's done is it's actually foregrounded for a lot of people that uh, photographs, images, visuals are incredibly important uh, as part of this social media transaction that takes place. So that's a really good part of it because basically it's making photography very prevalent in the eyes and minds of a lot of people. Obviously, there's a flip side of it in the sense that what happens then is um, people begin to limit themselves in terms of what images they actually take because they, they almost in a way kind of mimic 
or duplicate what has been deemed successful before. So, um, you know, the, the sorts of, we're talking about selfies, but it's not just a selfie, it is a particular style of, of selfie. Um, you know, a lot of influencers um, are practically quote unquote Instagram models because they are producing images that look very kind of fashion editorial, whatever it is that they're promoting or influencing on, on their platforms. Um, they, are, they are being photographed or photographing themselves or whatever it is they're photographing in a way that fulfills the need to gain more followers or, or, or promote a product or something along the lines of that. So even though everyone sorts of realizes that there is uh, a greater need for visual images, the variety is being reduced. The variety in visual imagery being produced because of social media has been reduced to a, a kind of repetitive duplication of what people deem to be successful. It's in, in photographic circles. It's kind of like, you know, someone taking a picture of something like the blue boat shading crawling in Perth, for example, and then it's successful. So everyone else goes there and they repeat the same process because they believe that Photographing that subject in that light from that angle can repeat that success. But what it simply does is it creates a super saturation of that image. So the power of the original image is so watered down by that, that repetition itself. Think about um, the Wanaka tree, for example, right in New Zealand, the sole autumnal tree in the lake growing out there. I'm sure the first time it was published, it blew the minds of people away. But now we look at it and we don't even give it a second glance because the, um, you know, media is so super saturated with images, you know, in the Wana tree. And, and even in Canada, for example, uh, I know there's a really blue lake. I think it's it, it, like it, it, the mountains coming down. What, what, lake, lake Louise, is it? Lake Louise or? and Moraine Lake. lake and Moraine lake. lake. There's so many images taken from the same lookout positions that initially it looks amazing, but eventually it's like, well, you know, nice. <laughs> you just kind of move on. So I think... I think what social media has done is it's actually created this, this uh, repetitiveness um, in the way people take photographs. Um, you know, people, very cynical people basically look at this whole thing where they can pull out very similar looking images. You know, someone in a red jacket standing in front of the giant waterfall in Iceland, for example, or someone on a rock in a red jacket and a hat overlooking a lake. That images, that those images have been repeated at nauseam. Um, so it's created this kind of... Um, a culture of imitation rather than a culture of, uh, of originality because I think the purpose of imagery in social media is actually governed not by the desire to actually create an image but the desire to gain some level of fame or notoriety through uh, social media uh, and not so much um, wanting to actually create images and for one reason i mean if you ask yourself right why am i putting images on social media if i get every person look, listening to this who uses instagram and ask and then they answer this question why am i posting this photograph on social media in my instagram and what would the answer be Probably. what's your answer stanley Probably. if you post a picture on instagram why do you post it on instagram my uh, my answer to post is that to share my um um my travel and my what of experience with other people and um you know those that's why i like to take those views that are quite unique because i want to show people um um you know that unique perspective that people never experience and share that kind of thing but yeah you're right i think a lot of um a lot of part of it is also to get that likes and also to get that comments right get that um sense of confirmation saying that you know yes you are doing the right thing yeah. um, so so there is two things to it and i think some people kind of have kind of have have it more towards one or the other depending on what they're doing i'm not sure if that's um, how you feel as well do you use hashtags on instagram totally why that's mainly because uh, for the business perspective side of things. And, um, so people can find your images, right? So people yeah, can find exactly. your images yeah, and it works with the Instagram algorithm and it increases exposure, increases likes. So the reason you're posting on Instagram is purely driven by the fact that you are trying to gain some level of exposure and gain some level of, um, you know, and that's the reason why I post on Instagram. I just I have no use of Instagram at all. So I don't use Instagram as a micro-blogging of my daily life or anything like that. I lead a very boring life. If I were to 
<laughs> deliberately post my life on Instagram will be like coffee, coffee, breakfast, cereal, you know. Oh, yeah, here's, uh, here's me driving to the shops, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a completely unglamorous life. So we, we create fictions on Instagram. We create fictions in social media. And I think that's what social media excels in. It excels in, in allowing us to curate um, the way we present ourselves and the way we present our work to the world. It's almost like having like a micro exhibition or having a publishing a, a mini book, except this one just keeps going on, on and on and on and on and on. So, um, so the impact of social media for me on, on photography is that it encourages a lot of photography. It doesn't matter what medium you're using, what, what, what camera you're using. It encourages a lot of photography. It encourages a lot of self-reflection and curation about your own photography. These things are extremely good things to have in your mind when you're a creative person. To be able to reflect and analyze your own work, to basically curate your own work so that you're not just putting rubbish out there, is a great things. But on the other hand, they're all kind of being moving in a direction of essentially mimicry and imitation rather than the creation of original stuff, stuff that may not resonate with other people, um, stuff that may not um, garner the likes and the followers and everything else um, <clears throat> that comes that comes with it. So yeah, we are we are doing the right thing in terms of curating and all that, but we're probably curating it in a direction that doesn't actually allow for the exploration and the expression and the presentation of a more personal vision. That's my take on it, anyway. That's uh, yeah, <clears throat> that's very interesting for you to say that. Um, yeah, I think um, it's, it, you're definitely right. Um, right there. Um, um, Instagram kind of help um, photographers to kind of get out there and share their story and all that stuff as well. But I think the the other side of thing is that people um, saw this popular photo that got that is successful and then they get really fixated with that. Um, and I think the really sad thing about that is like like what you say, you know, like when you do on Instagram, you do you will always want to try to do one for, you know, the followers and the likes and stuff. But also um, from my perspective, it's like, don't stop creating for yourself. So, you know, um, I think one of the, one of the education that I got from marketing um, on Instagram was saying that, yes, do you do your, you know, do your um, popular post and then put it out there, but don't discount the, the photo that really means something to you. And then, don't worry about how many likes you're going to get on it because you already get that likes from, you know, this popular one. So yeah, think, there's definitely a really hard balance there to take right now. I think the danger there is to actually approach things like that with a level of maturity and a level of self-awareness as well. A lot of people no longer, they stop taking pictures of what it is that they are appealing to. They're, they're taking pictures of what's popular because they, they, they're, they're using social media purely as a popularity contest. So I think that's, a, that's actually quite a, a sad part of it in the sense that a lot of people who are very, very skilled, very skilled, and uh, have the ability to create very fine images, but um, um, it, it's almost kind of being driven in a direction of creating what's popular, what's, what's going to appeal to the art market. It's a very business-oriented kind of approach. Huh? You know, rather than creating images that uh, that appeal to them, and who cares what happens? Let the images find the market. Let the images find its viewers, rather than creating images for an anticipated or expected audience. You know, it's, but at the end of the day, that's what art is. You know, do you create art because you know it's going to sell? In order to sell, it's got to basically appeal to a particular audience, right? A particular aesthetics, or do you create art? and hope that it finds its audience. And through finding its audience, you find a market for it. You know, which one's the easier one to do, right? Yeah, yeah. So. yeah totally. Um, I think what you say there is very correct. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame that a lot of people that have that potential of new perspective get kind of beaten down. And uh, I, I, you know, that was me for um, definitely, it was me when I started. I was, um, I was an Instagram photographer. I go to places that looks great on Instagram. And we thought having second thought, I would take that particular spot. I was like, where is that perspective taken for? And I took that. And um, it took me a while until I realized that, man, like, you know, like, this is not why I got here. You know, my mission was to to actually show people the world, the unseen world. It's like, why am I taking the photo that people take forever? Like, you know, all the time. So um, I think that that 
that message that you say you have to be true to yourself and define it for yourself is like really a home run for a lot of this because at the end of the day like um a lot of us see photography as a way to express ourselves and as a creative outlet in in our life right and um i think like there's a lot of people that even though they do like a full-time job a nine to five as an accounting or whatever they may be that photography become their creative outlet so yeah don't let that go away from from you so that's great yeah um, absolutely yeah absolutely yeah so you mentioned that um you used to um you used to um you are interested you're very interested on people people's story and uh, um and also like you know um history how how does that have um how how that storytelling have reflect in your photography and how that kind of translate from you know like words to um to to basically a single frame image yeah storytelling is one of those new buzzwords that have actually popped into photography um well, it's always been in part of photography, but at the moment, it seems to be in everyone's consciousness, partly because I think a lot of uh, competitions have judges who go on and on and on about how an image must tell a story and all that. So that's a, that, can be, uh, that can be quite a confusing thing for people to kind of think about. But a photograph a photographs as a static image in one frame. So how do you tell a story about, about a photograph in that static image? Um, the, the, way, the best way I can relate to that, basically, is let's say, for example, you are in a bookstore and you are browsing books, or you're in the library and you're browsing books. Now, you're not going to be able to read every single book there, right? So how do you assess which books are essentially going to appeal to you? You might look at the title, you might look at the cover, you might look at the author, and then you might open to the first chapter or the first few paragraphs, and then you read it. Now, there's got to be something in that initial process that's going to basically give you an indication that you want to read more, so you'll borrow or buy the book, okay? Um, and what is the thing that actually gets you to decide that you're going to invest more time in that book? Because, you know, when you read a book, you're basically telling, telling yourself and telling the world, hello, take three days of my life that I'll never get back because I'm going to invest it in reading this book. If you're going to watch a movie, okay, it's going to be an hour and a half of my life. I'm never going to get back, or two hours of my life, I'm never going to get back. So I'm going to, you know, you, you better be good, right? And what is the thing that actually pulls us in and makes us commit that aspect of our life, which we have in limited supply, um, to that? And that's where the story lies. It's, it's the hint, it's the hook that basically says, hey, it's worth investing time and emotion and to commit to this particular book or film or in the case uh, a photograph so the way i basically say when you're talking about storytelling and photographs the same concept coming through here there has to be a, a hook there has to be something that captures the interest of the viewer and asks for the viewer to commit time in engaging with that photograph in other words the viewer is almost in a way saying, I'm going to emotionally connect with this, this image. I'm going to spend some time exploring it visually. I'm going to try and get an understanding of what is actually happening um, in, in this image here. And in doing so, I'm actually going to receive a sense of something fulfilling or something satisfying through my engagement with that image. And that's what I mean by uh, the storytelling. We may have bought a book or borrowed a book and not finished reading it because it, it, it didn't go the way we wanted it to go. We didn't want to commit any further to it. Same thing with a movie or a film or whatever it is, right? Or, you know, if you binge watch um, Netflix and you watch, you know, season one of a, a series and by about midway to season one, you're going like, nah, I'm not going to, this is not interesting me at all. I've just wasted, you know, four hours of my life watching the first four episodes or something like that you're making a decision to abandon that because the story is no longer appealing to you. So I think a storytelling in an image is about having the viewer engage with the image or your image where they are investing time. They're committing their attention to it and they're engaging with it. So how do you, how do, you do that? For me, it's, about, it's, it's more than just being a pretty picture. So, you know, like um, if you're scanning 
a travel brochure and all the images that are amazingly beautiful because they're obviously selling the destination, right? And some of them you look at and you stare for ages and you can almost feel yourself kind of being there. And that's a story. That's an image that's captured that particular feeling and it's drawn the viewer into the image and the viewer is exploring the landscape in an image with the eyes and the imagination. That's a powerful image. It, it tells a story and it's drawing us into this narrative that you could look at a travel photograph or a documentary photograph or a portrait and you're investing in the emotion there. You look at a portrait of um, someone and you can identify with the emotion in your eyes, for example. You begin to explore what they're wearing and you're kind of relating what they're wearing to their life circumstances. You're looking at the background, what might be in the background, and you're kind of looking at how that background might relate to their life circumstances, their story. So you're investing more than just a cursory glance at the picture and that's a story that pulls them into that. So I guess the story lies in the story lies in the details that engage us and takes us into the the world that's represented in a photograph. It's not necessarily having something exciting happening. It's not necessarily having something that's kind of like visually explosive or anything like that. But it's the small things that make us linger longer in the image and gets us to invest and to enter the world of the image and in the same way in which we imaginatively enter the world that's being told to us in the book or which we engage emotionally with the characters that we watch in a film we actually care for them and we are uh, we don't want them to get you know they're in a bad circumstance as part and parcel of what makes dramatic tension in a, in a film but we want to see what happens to them and hoping hopefully it's a happy ending and that's why we stay until the end and i think the same kinds of emotions kind of apply in the way which we engage with photographs so if your images can tap into those very triggers that will get people to invest and commit and engage with those images on those levels, then it's a storytelling image. I hope that makes sense, yeah? Wow, that is, that is crazy. Um, like one other thing that I was, um, I'm very interested to, I actually had to put a note there just to make sure I don't forget. Um, you know, in this social media era or especially on the, you know, technology era, um, we, we get bombarded with content and everything, right? So um, if you look at Instagram, we hardly browse through a photo for more than two seconds. We look like next, look like next. Um, so what, what does it really take to create um, that, that photos that, um, you know, that, we, that we know as a creator that the story is in the details, but um, for the viewer, they might, they might not notice that within that two, three, or even the five seconds that they look at it. Um, what does it actually take to create that sort of um, photography that is so powerful to hook your, um, your viewer um, and engage them further into the detail of your photo? Are you talking about in a social media platform like Instagram? Or are you talking? You're talking about social media platform yeah, I mean, like Instagram. Right? I think I think it's just in in general, not only social media. Um, I think uh, you know we have a lot of competition, for example, right nowadays. And you know when you look at competition, we I think we can we can kind of think about you know less of the popular shot if if that's what you meant, kind of thing. Um, but also you know the judges um will have hundreds and hundreds of entries, right? right? So yeah. what does it take or you know how do you create that photo that's so powerful so that the judges will actually invest further as you said earlier within um, within that um, story or within that frame i think you know to answer the question you've got to kind of think about how we we as viewers read and process uh, visual images right um and a lot of that is quite often very very subjective as well um you know if, if we can't if we can make meaning of an image we are probably more um, willing to um, invest time in exploring it further. If we cannot make meaning of the image um, and there's nothing there that hooks us into it, then it's chances are, you know, just scroll past. If you're talking about something like Instagram, um, for example. So if what I think you're asking is what are the key elements that will allow an image to engage with the viewer when it is competing with a lot of other images in a saturated, image saturated kind of context, which could be Instagram, could be if you're judging a photographic competition, you might be looking at over 500, 700 thousands of images. So you have to make a decision very, very quickly. Um, if you go to a group exhibition and there are 50 images in the exhibition, 
you're not going to spend you know five minutes on each image you'll be there forever right so you're just going to scan and you're going to stop at certain images and what's going to do that what's going to pull you into those images over there now having said all of that i would say that this is probably a, not a very ideal context in which images should be looked at and consumed by people this mass production spamming of images is not the ideal situation obviously so when you have an exhibition you you curate it so that you're not having your images compete with each other uh, by having too many of them, for example. Okay, so, so I'll qualify that. So to say what's going to grab a viewer's attention, I think the first thing is you need a headline. You need that headline. It's like a newspaper article. You need that headline. And the headline needs to hook the viewer in. So if the image is something that the viewer is already familiar with, it's chances are they might just give it a quick glance and you know, double tapping to give a love heart in Instagram is so easy. It doesn't mean any meaningful in engagement at all, right? Um, so you scroll past. The actual hook would be basically something that makes the leader go WTF, I think. It's like, well, what is this? You know, what is this? What is this? And then that curiosity then prompts them to look more closely into, the, um, into what's actually happening in the image. And from that, they begin to try to find meaning in that image. And bearing in mind that the meaning that the viewer constructs out of the image is not necessarily the meaning that the photographer or the artist uh, invested into the image itself, but they're, they're, they're already engaged and they begin to draw meaning through gestures. They, get drawn, they, 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 be, they might lock onto certain expressions. Uh, they might, if it's a portrait, they might lock into certain detail in the images, uh, you know, things that appear. And then that, that, that helps them kind of create a, an image, uh, uh, kind of creates a story from the uh, processing of, uh, of the image itself, um, if, that, if that makes sense. That's why I was thinking to myself that the, uh, the most valuable comment that you can get in social media for any image you put in there is not nice capture or not great image or not awesome or not sensational and all that. Those sorts of uh, feedback, you know, or not when someone just goes love heart emojis, those things require no investment. That's just someone, you know, saying something to be polite and to acknowledge that, you know, they like your image. Um, it's when someone writes something and says, oh my God, I know the feeling of this person exactly, you know, because I've been in that position and this is what happened to me. And then they relay their own story uh, back. And that's when you know that there has been real emotional engagement in that photograph. And I think that's something that we should all aim to look at. An image of, say, a frozen field in the Rockies, and there might be a few struggling plants growing in it. If you put it on Instagram, and someone just puts thumbs up, thumbs up, or the thank you emoji, or the love heart emoji, or the kissy emoji, it means nothing, right? But if someone writes, my God, this takes me there and I can feel the cold in my bones. Now, that's real connection with, uh, with an image as opposed to love heart, love heart and double tap loves and all that kind of stuff. So uh, for me, if you're looking for real connection with the people looking at your images, if you're looking for your images to actually mean something to people and mean something so that you know, invest time in creating the images, you know, if, again, Whatever time you've gone into photographing, you've put into photographing and creating that image, it's time you're never going to get back, right? So, um, so you want what you produce to be meaningful, um, you know, to at least one other person out there in the world. Because if you can get a comment like that, then you know that you've achieved that particular achievement. You've actually got that. Um, and I think that's what we should, we should aim for rather than this kind of, oh, you know, to, to appease the algorithm of social media, I've got to post two pictures every day and I've got to post an Instagram story every day. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a mechanism. The mechanism asks us to engage, it, engage with it in a certain way in order to get the popular likes and all that. But, you know, is that, is that actually good for creativity? Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely yeah, that's great. Um, it's it's definitely a struggle between the creativity and uh, being able to reach more, especially with this like you know all the algorithm that kind of basically curate what 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 you know seen as popular. So uh, that's great. Um, yeah, look, um, 
it's, it's, it's coming to our mark. So I'm just going to ask you um, a couple more questions. One of the questions yeah. that I'm really interested to get your intake on this is that, um, um, especially based on what you just said before, should you caption your photo or should the viewer, um, you know, let, uh, interpret that to their own? Um, you know, what, what, what does the, um, what does the effect of the caption to, to, to an art of your photography, will it actually take away that message or will it actually strengthen it? I think it depends on the context in which the image is actually being shown or exhibited. Um, captions can sometimes empower images, make them make the, make the message, the meaning, the way it's consumed and understood and emotionally engaged with a lot stronger, incredibly stronger. And sometimes captions can impede in letting the viewer kind of just process and make their own meaning, so to speak, of, of the images coming over there. So it's not, a, it's not a binary outcome, yes or no, you know, kind of stuff. A lot of it depends on the, uh, a lot of it depends on, on the contexts in which the captions um, work. What I find more useful is something like an authentic artist's statement than a caption. So for example, if someone's having an exhibition or they publish a book or photographs, so I'm not, let's, let's, let's talk about Instagram and all that because that's, I think we've talked about that. Let's say you do, you do a photo book or you have an exhibition or something where your work is actually, or even if you've got an online gallery, right? Okay, uh, on your website. And you write like a statement from your heart, which means I'm not talking about some kind of highfalutin, you know, wanky type of, you know, artist statement, something that's really from your heart about, about your experiences in making the images, about uh, perhaps the motivation in making the images. I generally speaking, don't talk about the meaning in my images. I talk about, uh, about, about what, they, what, what they are to me and, and why I photograph them and stuff like that, but I don't prescribe what people should make out of those images there. Um, and talk a lot more about myself and what drives me as a photographer and all that. And then let that become like an overarching um, context in which um, people can then use that and apply to the image and see how the images have come about through this particular uh, mindset that the artist had uh, as, a, as a creative person rather than writing individual captions. But having said that, sometimes captions, especially for press images and documentary images, sometimes captions are can really kind of uh, work very powerfully with the images so that both of them together, almost symbiotically, um, create an experience for the viewer slash the reader that each of them individually could not have achieved. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I actually, I, I always, um, almost always put a story behind the photo, you know, what, what was it like and um, what, what, um, what my experience, why I go out that day and so forth. Um, but one of the reasons why I, um, I want to ask you this question was that um, just the other day I have, um, I, I saw a comment on, um, on one of the phot photography group. And then that's what he said. It's like, ah, oh, you know, like I'd rather not have captions. So I, you know, after our conversation about storytelling, I was really interested to uh, see your take on that. So yeah, that's, that's really good. Cool. Well, um, yeah, look, you've been an educator for a while now and um, you've got into photography um, for a while now. Um, for those of you who just want to start it and who kind of like, um, you know, got interested and want to create something that is meaningful and that's strong out there, what is the one advice, um, you know, one of the most important advice that you would give them? Complete this sentence. I take photographs because, I take photographs because dot, dot, dot. And complete that sentence. That's amazing. <laughs> Simple so, as that. That's all it is. Because it has to come personally. It can't come. No, whatever reason you give after the dot, 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 that's fine. But you just have to define that for yourselves first. Um, find out what it is that, that interests you so much that you want to actually take uh, photographs of it. And then work towards um, being the best at it that you can be in what it is that you want to take photographs of. Um, and sometimes you might need to actually push your own comfort um, bound your boundaries, basically, to um, break through any kind of resistance that your own self might have had 
to achieve that particular outcome. And I'll give you a really quick example of that one. As I said earlier, I have a very strong interest in people and I really wanted to connect with them. But uh, in the early days, when uh, now, probably 15 or so years ago, more than that actually, um, it's hard to approach strangers to ask for their photographs, especially when you're first starting out. And because I you know, engage with a lot of photographers now, that's still a perennial concern and anxiety with a lot, of, a lot of photographers who want to take photos of people, but they just are not out there with their personality. So I came up with a strategy to get past my own fears and anxieties. And that was to actually have a purpose in the reason why I wanted to take photographs of people. And that purpose was to actually basically, well, uh, create a community photographic project. Um, and the photo community photographic project was essentially tied into what was happening in the world at that particular point in time. And at that particular point in time, uh, this was, I think, just probably after what had happened in Bali and everything else with, uh, with the bombing. So it's going back quite a long time. And there was a lot of fear and a lot of anger and a lot of uh, uh, suspicion and all that. And I thought one way in which you can actually combat that is to actually um, you know, get people to express in writing uh, their commitment to basically still be good people, basically. So I went around and I wrote on a piece of card, I wrote a, a very simple three or four word statement and I went to people and I said, hey, I'm doing a community project where I'm photographing people. If they're willing to commit, they just had to be photographed holding this card. And that's how I got through um, the fear or the anxiety of actually approaching people. Of course, some people say no, but then they say no to the project. They didn't say no to me. And that was a great way of actually um, getting past any of those initial hesitancy when it comes to that. And after that, that was perfectly fine to approach people because you've already built up a particular pattern and a particular level of uh, confidence. Wow. Uh, that's it. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, yeah, that's uh, one sentence that is really strong. And um, it's really interesting because I've never really actually asked myself that. And, um, you know, that's uh, even for me who've been taking photo for a while, who've been interested for in photography for a while. And I think I know the purpose of my photography, but I think it's, you know, by answering that question, it really, really, you know, hit that home run. So fantastic. You know, thanks a lot for the, for the advice. That's, that that's good. Yeah, that's, uh, it's amazing. I'm pretty sure I'm the listener at, the, at home, especially those of you who kind of just started and not sure where to go with your photography you can take this and, um, yeah, build your own um, meaning and, you know, express yourself to a photography instead of um, looking at other things uh, or other people work and try to mimic them. So that's amazing. So for um, those, uh, for the listeners who's interested to learn more about yourself, um, Seng, um, what's the best way to find you? Oh, okay. So I'm obviously all, on all over social media as well, but I don't, I don't, I don't garner a very large following in the tens of thousands or something along the lines of that. I use it, you know, for my own personal purposes and stuff like that. But um, my website is venturephotography.com.au. So they can go there and they can look at the courses. So it'll probably be more relevant for people in Australia, especially in versus Australia. If you want to learn photography with me, if you want to go on my tours and stuff like that at the moment or next year, it's just within Western Australia only. Um, go to www.venturephotography.com.au and you can see what's basically on offer there, you can follow me on Instagram on Seng Venture, which is my name, S-E-N-G, then the word Venture together. And that's mainly kind of like my, my travel landscape kind of work um, there. Uh, and then obviously on social media, you can connect with me on Venture Photography Workshops on Facebook or just look for my name, Seng Ma, on Facebook, pretty much. And uh, yeah. Um, and I've also got a YouTube channel, but I currently don't, I'm not a YouTube type influencer. I use the YouTube channel more as a learning resource where I put a lot of videos, how to videos and all that for the classes and people that I teach. I put them up there. During the lockdown um, this year, when WA locked down for about six or seven weeks uh, and people were at home and they couldn't do anything, I ran, uh, I ran live um, Zoom webinars and sessions like this and had guest speakers and we did um, you know, things on portraiture and how to use your camera and all those kinds of stuff. Uh, on, and we have a group on Facebook called Photography, 
uh, which is uh, spelled P H O T A L K graphy, like Paul Talk, but it's oh, okay. T A L K graphy on Facebook. And that's pretty much it. That's where you can find me. Oh yeah, fantastic! I mean, um, you got you got amazing work. So um, for those of you who are interested in travel, um, I actually learned how to use um, light and flash. Um, I still use that technique. It's um, it's 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 an amazing technique, especially the one that you thought um, during the daylight, but you make everything underexposed, so it looks like. Oh yeah, light. yeah. I love that technique. Turn, turn day into night. Yes, with a flash. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> I love that technique. I still like it. Was definitely one of my favorite techniques. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I still teach that. <laughs> so if you find a flash course with me, you kind of learn how to do that. <laughs> I would never think of it. You know, think of that in in a million years. So that was amazing to learn. Um, but yeah, like um, you know, Sang is also a uh, professional accredited uh, photography and has um, won a few absent documentary awards. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I was WA Professional Documentary Photographer of the Year a couple of years ago. Yeah, and I've quite often been a finalist in the Professional Travel Photographer of the Year awards and things like that. Yep. Exactly. So I um, highly recommend to check out his work. And um, yeah, um, thanks a lot for tuning in. And hopefully you enjoy that. Hopefully you get a lot of that. There was a lot of wisdom in that. Um, and thank you very much, Seng, for coming in. Um, but apart from that, I'll see you guys um, next week, Wicked Hunters. Hopefully you guys have a good weekend. Till next time.